Welcome to the Dropout Multimillionaire Podcast, hosted by best-selling author and serial entrepreneur, Brian Will. Here we go. All right, I'm super excited for today's episode. So for our listeners out there, I discovered Brian when I was going on Kindle. I saw a book. It looked interesting. I went, okay, I have a flight coming up. I'm going to buy this book. I read it in one sitting. I got his next book. And, and during that time, I went, I need this guy on my podcast. So Brian, thank you for taking the time to be on this week's episode of the Silicon Valley podcast. For our listeners out there, I've done a ton of research on your background. It's phenomenal. But can you give our listeners a little bit of your career, a little bit of your history up until this point? Oh, my gosh, Sean, thanks for having me. And I want to tell you, one of the best compliments you can get as an author is when somebody tells you they sat down and read your book in one reading. That means it was actually interesting enough to not put it down. So that's actually a huge compliment. Thank you. But uh, yeah, so the, the, I've done so many things in my life and career. I'll, I'll try to give you the two minute fast version and then you can ask me about anything you want. So growing up in an abused home, failed out of high school my junior year, managed to get back in, graduated with a 1.2 grade point average, went into the military, served in both the Air Force and the Army, two branches, got out. Tried to get a job, couldn't hold a job as a as a land as a uh, construction worker working at Little Caesars. I got fired working as a waiter in a restaurant. I got fired. I mean, I couldn't hold a job. I finally got a job as a busboy at Applebee's, and that was my job for a year until I got married. My wife was a waitress at the time, so I got married. Didn't know what to do. Took a job doing landscaping, and I thought I'm going to start my own business because I couldn't stand working for people. So the first company was landscaping. Did that for eight years, franchised it, and then lost everything. A lot of good lessons in that loss. Um, second business I started was uh, selling insurance. And uh, after about a year and a half, this was the beginning of the dot-com era, ended up somehow magically, you know, lucky created the very first call center to sell health insurance uh, in the country. And uh, we got acquired by one of the early uh, online insurance carriers. There were only three at the time. So did that. Went to work for those guys after they acquired me. We developed a software program that uh, was an enrollment platform for carriers. And that company ended up going public under the name Connecture. And then I went back private again. They're basically the backbone for Medicare today. Started another company back in the insurance business. Built it for a couple of years. Sold it to another venture capital firm. That one's called GetInsured.com today. I think they're the largest state-based exchange carrier uh, out there. So if you go into 10 or 12 states and you buy insurance, it's on our old platform. Did another company uh, online. It was uh, called Monetize It, where we were a lead gen aggregator. I sold it to a private equity firm back in 2006. Uh, that was a big deal, big sale for us. Uh, started another company. We sold to HGS, which is out of India. Uh, along the way, I bought some restaurants. I have a small chain of restaurants in Atlanta. Uh, I own a small technology company again today. I have a real estate company. Wrote a couple books, uh, one, both of which you uh, talked about when we started here. Got into politics. Uh, I serve on city council in my local uh, hometown, and there's probably another dozen companies I forgot, but uh, that's uh, that's the quick and dirty. All right, for our listeners at home, definitely get the books, and you'll you'll realize one thing: Brian is extremely modest. The the companies that he built, I mean, read the books. But going into that, you mentioned a lot there from well, little Caesars, lots to unpack. Was hilarious, <laughs> but you know, franchise into sell into all these. Of all those businesses that you created or a part of, which ones did you grow? Which one, I guess, did you grow the most as an operator? I will tell you that probably my first failure taught me some of the most important business lessons on not overextending yourself, not getting too deep into debt, not living above your means, not putting the majority of your business with one contractor so that when that contractor fires you, and withholds a hundred and fifty thousand dollar payment, and you can't pay your bills anymore because you have no savings and tons of debt. That one stuck with me for the rest of my life, and I'm very, very careful about money today because of that first failure. As a business operator, probably the internet company we sold because it blew up so fast, and I got involved into the private equity world and the venture capital world, and started learning my way around there and figuring out how that works. So that one probably was the most growth. Uh, what well, I had the most growth and, and honestly, the biggest lesson probably there was learning to trust my partners, work with other people, let people do what they're good at, understanding what you're good at and what you're not good at, which is a big lesson in my books. 
um, bringing the right team members on, having the right people to help you. And that's how you, you know, really grow uh, a company huge. But I'll tell you, every single business taught me something. And one of the, one of the focus points in my books is, you know, the old adage that, that you, you have to fail to succeed. And, and I say, I, my, one of my last podcasts, I just said this, failure doesn't lead to success. Failure leads to failure. Okay. Learning from failure is what leads to success. And that's the key. So every time somebody says you got to fail to succeed, you got to call BS on that. It's learning from the failure. And if you can learn from every single time you fail, you will eventually figure it out and you'll eventually succeed. And that's what I did. I'm a 20 year overnight success. That's what I like to call myself. You gotta love it within the first five minutes of podcast. You already have the snippet. You're going to cut from it to, to market <laughs> and push. I love that. The it's not, it's the learning from the failure that that's key going back to, I mean, one of the things you'd mentioned, the, the landscaping where someone withheld $150,000 and the lessons you learned for that were, was a lesson of kind of who the partners were, because then in your next company, it was trust your partners or was it, Hey, I have to de-risk who I'm doing business with by smaller amounts or what were some of the lessons learned there? Cause it, it could be so many different things. So the big one was that at the time we had the majority of all the revenue in this company was with one general contracting company that built multifamily homes. So we were doing apartment complex construction all over the place. Well, we got so focused on them that I kind of forgot everything else. And that was my only client. And so when your only client fires you and withholds payment, you're in trouble because you still got the bills. You still got my personal bills, the company bills, the payroll, the creditors, supplies. So don't ever, ever get yourself in a position where one person can control your business and your future because that's where you get in trouble. I'll tell you where I took that lesson. When I sold my second company, I remember I sold it. This was 1999. I sold it for a million dollars. And at the time, I thought that was a lot of money, right? But as I like to joke, you get a million dollars once you pay your taxes and then you pay your house off. There's like a hundred grand left. You're broke again. You got to go get a job. (laughs) That's if the house is not in California. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Then you're still in debt. (laughs) But I had a little $350,000 house. So I pay my taxes I pay my house. I had a hundred grand left. But I remember when I went down to the bank to pay that house off and the banker said, don't pay your house off. By the way, this is January of 2020. And if you remember January, 2020, dot com was booming. And he goes, take that money. Let me invest it. I said, no, I'm paying my house off. I learned my lesson from my last company. I'm not getting myself in trouble again. It took me 20 minutes to convince the banker to let me pay my house off. And what happened in March of 2020? The bubble burst. And if I had listened to him, I'd have lost that all that money and I'd be right back where I started. So I also remember that lesson. Protect yourself. Uh, I, so I, I grew up in Silicon Valley. I was in high school at that time. And I remember quite a few of my, the, not, 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 a, not a ton, but there are definitely a few that said, hey, I'm not going to college. I'm just going to work at my dad's startup. Yep. And this was 2000. And then a year later, come back from freshman year of college and I look around, buddy's house is for sale. You know, he's, <laughs> he's applying for junior college. It's, yeah. it's, it changed just like that. So, just less, lessons in money in my book is one of them is protect yourself because you don't know what's going to happen next. For your companies, you'd mentioned, you know, that one that you sold. I mean, for these companies, you'd had investments from private equity, from individuals, you were acquired by venture capital. What happens to the, what happened to the companies that you started and were building once you took outside capital? What was the difference from before and after? So that's interesting. The one I just told you that we sold, I got the million dollars for, we went in, we were like employees number eight through 20. My, my team was, they were brand new, just took $26 million of venture capital. And we were being manager that owned our CEO was 27 years old, fresh out of MBA school, didn't have a clue, but thought he was the smartest guy ever. And it's always cracks me up. They bought my company. And the first thing they did is stick me in a small cubicle in the middle of the, the, the floor and tell me I was no longer qualified to run my company because I didn't have a college education or an MBA. So they brought in a young, sharp MBA to take over my company. I love that. The guy bombed, like didn't have a clue what he was doing. But I can just remember these stories. Like we took this money in and we were spending money on the dumbest things you can possibly imagine. I, I, don't, I don't even have time to go into all of them, but I'll give you one story. We were doing, we were doing advertising on the radio 
And I remember I was in the, the senior exec meeting and our chief marketing officer was telling us that she had just, you know, secured all these uh, radio ads for to advertise us. And she told, showed us how much it was. And I remember looking down this piece of paper at how much she was paying for radio ads. And I knew what I was paying for radio ads before that. And she was paying double. And I remember we got out of the meeting and I went to the CEO and I said, hey, man, I can get those radio ads for half. And he goes, prove it. So I literally picked up my phone, called my, my uh, rep at the local radio station. I said, hey, how much can I get these ads for? And he goes, I'll give them to you for X number of dollars, which was half. I went up, I told the CEO, he goes, all right, thanks. I go to the lunchroom. I'm sitting in the lunchroom. Lunchroom's full of people. All of a sudden, here comes the CMO. She's blazing in there. Where's Brian? And <laughs> she's yelling my name and the lunchroom clears out. People are running for the hills, man. What are you doing getting in the middle of my deal? I said, you're paying double. I don't know what you're doing. You're just wasting money. She goes, we're supposed to waste money. We're supposed to lose money. That's what our investors expect. And I remember thinking, or I told her, I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. If we can get it for half, we should pay half. Why would you throw money away? Anyway, huge argument. She never talked to me again. And she ended up getting fired about six months later. <laughs> but that was just what we did. We just spent money on the dumbest things. Do you have any other, any other stories about burning capital? <laughs> yeah. So they come to us later and they're like, Hey, we're going to, by the way, we're selling individual health insurance, by the way. Okay. Individual health insurance policies at a retail level back then. This was before we transitioned the company. So she comes in uh, on another deal and she says, Hey, we just paid a hundred thousand dollars to have our CEO interviewed. And they're going to play his interview on Delta airlines on the East to West coast flight in first class. And I said, I said, hold on a second. Who's flying in first class from Atlanta to LA? And they were like, well, business people. I said, probably working for big companies, right? And they're like, well, yeah. I said, they don't buy our product. Why are we spending a hundred thousand dollars to advertise our product to people who aren't going to buy it? And they were like, it's good branding. I'm like, that's just idiotic. But we don't need to brand to people who aren't going to buy our product. We should focus our money on people who are going to buy our product. That's how we succeed. But they were all about this branding thing, man. So how was that kind of, I don't know, mentally or that when you went from building this company to selling it and then going from this position of I'm running it to kind of a cog in the wheel with inferior, inferiority, people with inferiority complexes on top? Look, I had a big office in the corner of our building with a TV and cable. I'd watch country music station during the day. I got my computer. I got my secretary. They buy me out and they literally stuck me in a cubicle about two by two in the middle of this cubicle row. And I, and I sat there and I thought, what am I doing? This is insane. And I lasted about, I think I lasted nine months. And then one day I, I there's another long story behind this, but I literally got up and just walked out the door and start another company. Uh, well, I'm curious about that story, but I also I'm curious about any advice you can give our audience, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of them, their goal is to sell their company, how they should look at the people on the other side of the table to know if they're a good fit, to know that they're not going to be placed in that two by two cubicle or in a situation that they're not going to be happy in. You know, a lot of this, of, of course, everything is negotiable up until they give you the check, right? I was coming from a huge disadvantage. I'll tell you one of the disadvantages I had in almost every company I sold is the fact that I didn't go to college, didn't have that MBA, didn't have that, those credentials. And in the three companies I sold in all three cases, as soon as they acquired my company, they pushed me out. They said, we, I remember the one out of Silicon Valley was a Bessemer deal. And they said, we can't even put you on the website because you don't have a college degree. So just go back to Atlanta. You can run the office over there, but we can't tell anybody who you are. So I'm surprised I, I, at Silicon Valley. I mean, gosh, here you hear people doing a 15 week boot camp and getting VC money. I, well, I, this was 2008. So maybe things have changed since then. Back then, that degree was it was the number one thing. I was good enough to build it. Just don't tell anybody who I am. Voice made me laugh. So in these companies that you that you were building, did you ever have a co-founder? And if so, was there any? Yes. Ever any times where there's disputes, how did you resolve them? Yeah. So the big company we sold, which was Monetize It, that we sold to the private equity firm, there were uh, essentially four partners in that company. 
And I get into a lot of this in the book also, and it's called the four personalities, a successful uh, business. And this was where I really learned that. So I I always say in in a successful business, you have to have an entrepreneur, you have to have a manager, a salesperson and a specialist, right? And by the way, anybody who just heard that, who's ever read the e-myth probably knows that I stole some of those ideas from that book, but I lived it. And so I just rewrote it. Uh, but we had Steve who was the entrepreneur. I was the operator. I handled legal and finance. Joe was our technician and Roger was our salesperson. None of us could do the other person's job. All of us needed to be there in order to make the company successful. And we got into yelling matches sometimes like two of the partners got into a fist fight at a New York East New, New Year's Eve party once. And again, cleared the room and these guys are rolling around in the floor. But at the end of the day, we all knew we couldn't do it without each other. So you get up, you brush it off, you press on, and we went on and sold the company. I will tell you an interesting thing, though. After we sold that company, only two of the partners, three, two, only two of the partners remained friends. The other two left mad. I'm curious about, oh, but Brian, quick question. You're uh, hitting the, the table with your hands oh, a little I'm bit. Oh, I'm sorry. But tell us about that, because I would think all four would come to the table. Yeah, maybe before they, there are some disagreements, but after they have a huge win, they would go, you know what? Life is great. And, and remember the good old days from the beginning. Uh, so my senior partner used to have this phrase. He said, we're all friends until we talk, start until we start making money. And once you start making money, everybody thinks it was them. Our tech guy thought, well, you can't do this without me. I'm the most important person here. This is all about me. And the sales guy was like, well, you can't do this. I'm doing all the sales. It's all about me. And so that was his favorite saying. When she start making everybody's friends, you start making money. And then the disagreements start to come about because everybody's already rich now. We're making money. We got a big exit coming. And they all think it was all about them. And so, you know, they left mad. It was interesting. Any ways that, that people can stay friends longer or any way to rekindle? Yeah, get your ego in check. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I talk about that a lot. Look. The biggest failure point for new entrepreneurs is their ego. Mm-hmm. They can't, they can't get their ego aside to let somebody help them, or they can't get their ego aside to let, to realize that you need other people to help you. You can't do it all yourself. And that's an ego issue. Speaking of new entrepreneurs, what skill sets would you recommend people learn before or early on in their building their, their first company? You know, I like to say that Success in business is more of a mindset than a skill set. Okay. You can be really good at the skill set, but you might not be good at the actual running of a business. And, and, and to put it simplistically, and we probably got some high profile people on here, but I call it Joe the plumber, right? Joe the plumber is a great plumber. He starts his own business. Joe's business isn't going to fail because he can't do plumbing. Joe's business is going to fail because Joe doesn't know how to run a business. And this goes for programmers or people that sell products or people that design stuff. Make sure that you understand who you are. If you're the technician, if you're the skill set of whatever it is you're doing, you need to bring somebody else in to help you. And that's the biggest, the biggest failure point for most entrepreneurs. We're back to that ego. They want to have the ego to say that I'm the boss, I'm the CEO. And maybe you're not. Maybe you're the guy that's doing the work, right? And you need to bring somebody else to do the rest of it. Like Bill Gates is not the CEO of Microsoft. Steve Jobs wasn't the CEO at the end of, of, of Apple. Sometimes you got to bring in people who know how to do those things better and let you do what you're good at. With your companies, they've all seemed to be successes. When did you realize this have to keep the ego in check? How come it never blew up for you? Everybody, I, look, I have that problem all the time. I'll give you an easy example. When I wrote the book, uh, I remember when we were doing the cover design and I submitted a cover design to my publicist and she came back and she said, this sucks. It needs to be redone. And I said, no, it doesn't. I am successful business person. I am going to design my own book cover. And she said, well, I'm just telling you, if you go with your cover, it's not going to sell. And even I, after arguing with her a few times, had to step back and go, hold on a second. What am I doing here? I don't know anything about book cover designs. This is a person who's done hundreds of designs. I got to check my ego, let her do what she knows how to do. I let her do the design and quite frankly, it came out great. So it's just one of those things, you know, you gotta, you gotta mentally make sure you keep your ego in check. And that's a lot of self-reflection. Speaking of kind of egos and egos in check, not only founders at the beginning, but I mean, here in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of billionaires. There's a lot of people that have exited companies, super successful, and they're out there giving advice to, to everyone everywhere. 
should people be listening to, to the advice of the uber <laughs> successful or where should they uh, get you, their advice you, from you stole this quote out of my book sean but possibly <laughs> it's, it's honestly so, my favorite For here's all what i like listeners to say. out there <laughs> when i read this quote or i when i read this i paused sat on it and went oh my god this this was kind of that moment where i was like i got to reach out to the author of this book okay brian <laughs> So I say this in the book and I'm very sincere because most of the time I'm talking to people who are in startups or they're, they're up and rolling, but they can't get it. Stop chasing the advice of billionaires. Okay. Stop. If I was running a small tech company, Elon Musk can't help me. He's so far above where we are. He's thinking in terms of taking people to Mars and, you know, populating planets and launching rockets and changing the entire world. You need to find somebody that is like 10 steps ahead of you and take their advice because they just finished going through the things you've gone through. They just finished failing at the things you're about to fail at. They're the ones that can tell you, hey, man, Sean, don't do that. Do this. I just did that. and It didn't work. This is how I change it. This is how we succeeded. That's the person you need to take advice from, not a billionaire. They're, they're, they're way too far into the stratosphere to work with a startup. Was there any advice that that you took? that you listened to that was bad advice, what happened? Most of my bad advice I gave myself. <laughs> that, that's a fact that, that we're back to the ego. It's making decisions without letting other people help you. This is why I'm so big on bringing in a coach or a mentor or, and taking, getting that person that's ahead of you and letting them help you make those decisions. Because if you're listening to yourself and this gets into the personal filter I talked about in chapter one in the book, you don't know what you're doing when you're a startup. Unless you've done it before successfully, you don't know what you're doing. So you need to find somebody to help you check the ego and listen to them. Otherwise, the worst advice you're ever going to get is going to be from yourself. Okay, with that advice or finding that coach, should, there's so many people out there that, that claim they're coaches or consultants. Should you be looking for someone that's in the same sector that has had exits should you look for someone that has these certifications or a therapist or how do you know? Hey, Sean, I can go online right now for $149 and get my coaching certificate. Is that really going to help you? I tell people this all the time. You need to vet the people you're taking advice from. I don't care how fancy their website looks. I don't care how great the pictures are. I don't care how many pictures on stage they've got. If they've never done it, then they can't tell you how to do it. Nobody can teach you something they've never done. And by the way, you can have coaches in multiple areas, right? If I want to be a, if I want to write code or, or design websites, I'm going to go find somebody that's done that, not somebody that's run, you know, a landscaping company who's also very good at that. It's so whatever niche it is that you're in or whatever you're specifically trying to accomplish, that's the person you need to find. In my own case, I do coaching, but a general business level, right? I just finished some stuff with with Molly made, which is a franchise company owned by neighborly. I didn't talk about how to clean houses. I talked about how to manage your P and L's. I talked about how to motivate yourself to get out of bed and go do your job and how to do a better job at selling and marketing. That's general business coaching. If you find somebody who's been success, successful, that's done that, then listen to their advice, but make sure you vet them. There's too many people out there that don't have a clue what they're talking about. And quite frankly, they're just hurting people. Going back to, to just looking at businesses. I mean, you've started companies, sold them. You've also gone on and acquired businesses, correct? Yeah, I, I've, I, I got into the restaurant business, weirdly enough, which is my, the cliche, every professional athlete or business guy gets out and he's like, hey man, I'm going to buy a restaurant. So I did. When um, you were looking at that situation, how did you go about analyzing it? I didn't. That's why I lost so much money. <laughs> but I learned. And then... I started getting better at it. And now I have a small chain of restaurants that are extremely profitable. But the first one I bought, you know, I was sitting there drinking and they said it's for sale. So I bought it. I mean, that was, I, I was, I had just sold my company. My bank account was like bleeding cash. I didn't know what to do with it. So I bought a restaurant. I lost about, I don't know, $50,000 that first year. And then I thought that wasn't fun because the business mind kicks in and you're like, hold on a second. This is dumb. I own a business. I'm losing money. I got to figure out how to do this. So I did a second one. I lost money. A third one, I lost money. And then I'm like, okay, I really got to figure this out. Then I started figuring some things out and then we became successful after that. But I like to joke as smart as I think I am. I'm only seven for 12 in the restaurant business. Well, still, I mean, restaurants, they always say it's the third owner that makes any money. 
I don't know about that. <laughs> the first one builds it out, spends too much. The second one gets it at a discount, but still bleeding. And the third one gets it for pennies on the dollar and somehow turns it around. So it's inches out that much profit, or at least that's kind of the, uh, I, I bought four restaurants for $0. The joke is the guy, when he got to the closing table, I said, I'm not giving you any money, but I'll let you drink for half price for six months. And he said, okay, <laughs> <laughs> I bought four restaurants doing about 6 million in revenue. Yeah. Well, that's well, that's Brian, negotiation, that, baby. How do you give us some negotiation tips? <laughs> uh, so I've got several that I talk about. In fact, I, I literally just did these. My last podcast I released was called Negotiation. And the the number one rule to negotiation is knowing the most powerful word in the in the spoken language. And it's no. Just no. I would say if you if you get stuck, just say no. If you don't know what to do, say no. If you're confused, just say no. But it's so powerful to tell somebody no. And then the power of silence comes right after that. You know, it's the old adage the next once you say no, the next person to speak loses. Uh, so I'll give you a quick story. I was buying this restaurant and I went in and I looked at the deal and we went through the whole due diligence and I got down to the last, the, you know, the closing table and it was a hundred thousand dollar deal, a little bar. And I went to closing table and I sat there, me and the seller and my broker. And I said, here's the honest truth, Mike. I, I'm, I can't give you a hundred thousand dollars for this business. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to give you zero for it. And he was like, what, what do you mean zero? I said, I can't give you hundred thousand dollars. I'm, I'm just not going to do that. That's, that's not a deal. And I just sat there and he sat and looked at me and this went on for like three minutes. And finally he goes, well, I can't take nothing, man. As soon as he said that, you know, I knew I had him and about 10 minutes later, I bought it for $10,000, which is $90,000 off. Right. But it's because I said, no, it's because I then let, I waited to let him talk. Okay. And then as soon as he talked, he gave it up. I knew I had the deal. Now, in all fairness, my third point of negotiation is question asking. And I ask more questions than can humanly be possible sometimes. And what I had learned, I always say, if you keep asking questions, people will hand you the keys to a deal. What I learned is that he had already taken another job. I learned that his lease was coming due in 60 days and he didn't want to re-sign another one with a personal guarantee. I knew that his franchise agreement was coming due. And he didn't want to sign another 10 year franchise agreement. So when I sat there and told him I wasn't going to give him any money, I knew he didn't have a choice. And so when I offered him the final 10,000, I knew that he knew that was all there was, or he was going to get nothing. And so I got the deal for 90% off because I'd ask a lot of questions. And then I told him no, right? These are negotiation skills. I always tell people, listen, if you're not good at negotiation, you better bring in somebody to help you negotiate because you do not want to run up against somebody else who is good at negotiation. Well, with that, how do you determine, I guess, if you are good or you're not good at negotiations, leaving the, the ego aside? Because, you know, everyone, with an, I would guess the ego will probably tell everyone they're great at negotiations. When in reality, <laughs> it, it's quite different. I have two, two, two of my favorite sayings. The first one is when a man with experience meets a man with money, the man with money will get an experience. And the man with the experience will get the other man's money. So that's my first favorite saying. My second one comes from Richard Branson. And it's, if your first offer doesn't insult them, you offer too much. Okay. And how it relates back to my no is if your offer doesn't insult them, you've offered too much. And do you know why he says that? Because if he's up against another negotiator, the first thing they're going to say is no. And that's the beginning of the negotiation. So we, we know everybody asks too much for what they want or they offer, you know, less than what they're willing to give you for whatever the price is. So you always counter way low so that you have a lower starting point. Cause if you're up against a negotiator, their first answer is no. And if you're a good negotiator, your first answer is no. And now we can begin negotiating. But now we know where we both stand. I love that. And in negotiations, how do you know if it's a good acquisition or a bad acquisition? Ah, you ever heard of the winner's curse? <laughs> Tell our the winner's the winner's curse says that if you're negotiating and you win, you just paid more than anybody else on planet Earth was willing to pay for whatever it is you just got. So did you really win? That's the winner's curse. So I don't know if it's a good deal. If it was worth it to you in the end, if it was a good deal. 
I, I've, I've made people what I thought were low ball offers and they accept, accepted them right out of the gate. And I walked away going, damn it, I should have offered less. Even I messed that one up. <laughs> I mean, negotiations are, are, I mean, it's a skill. If you, what happens if, I mean, you're not negotiating anything for a while. Do you, do you ever feel rusty? Do you ever feel, listen, I just got to get out there and, and have some conversations to keep, keep sharp. The key is the negotiation is asking questions. That's all it is. You need to, I say this is a key to success in business. As a business owner and entrepreneur, you don't need to know everything. In fact, you don't know everything. The most important skill you can have is asking the right questions. If you ask enough questions, you will eventually ask the right questions and then you will figure out everything you need to know. In a negotiation, you ask questions. That's how I found out the guy had gotten a job. That's when we called the landlord, found out the lease was due. That's how we found out that his franchise agreement was coming due. You just keep asking questions. Forget trying to close. I hate the word closing a deal. I hate that. Because if you're trying to close a deal, then you didn't do enough due diligence and you didn't ask enough questions. That deal should have been done before you ever got to the so supposed close, right? So questions, questions, questions. That's how you figure it out. And in all these negotiations and all these companies, was there, ever, was there a time that you said, listen, it's time for me to move on, depart. That's why I want to sell. Or was there an offer, an unsolicited offer that would come in and that's why you'd decide, okay, now's the time. Like what? what I'll give you a funny story. On? We, we were, we had an offer from uh, a private equity group out of Boston and uh, we, and they had offered us 40 million at the time. And we flew up to Boston, me and my senior partner. And he's like, you're talking, man, you're, you're talking. I said, okay. So it's like, we're at this long boardroom table and there's like five of them on one side and me and Steve on the other. And, and they said, after the due diligence, we've decided to lower our offer from 40 to 35 million. And I said, I appreciate that guys, but we're not interested. No. And I remember Steve kind of looked like slowly turned his head and looked at me like, what are you doing? I said, we're just not interested. We'll get a better offer uh, down the road. So appreciate your time today. And they tried to change our mind. I said, we're, we're just not interested. We're not doing that. And they, they gave me every justification in the world. And I just said, no, because you got to play the long game, right? And we ended up leaving. And all, on the entire flight home, Steve kept going, are you sure? Are you sure? I said, I'm sure, man. It's going to be all right. It's going to be good. 30 days later, we got an offer for 80 from another private equity firm. And I said, I told you. So sometimes you just got to be willing to walk away, you know? Were there any feelers out there? Were you running a process or is just another? these guys were on our front step when we got to work at 7 a.m. in the morning? They had heard about us and they flew two guys down and were waiting on us to get there. It was funny. OK, so that turned out to be a, a super success. Do you have stories of selling a company that was a disaster? Any horror stories there? <laughs> Uh, I've got stories uh, and I'm of earnouts and equity, uh, equity turned to nothing that, that company, by the way, we sold, they rolled us up into a, uh, larger digital marketing agency. And we took 30 million on earnout out the back door, which was 20 million on our 20 million, on, 10 million on earnout and 20 million in equity. So we took 55 million, I think it was 20 on, uh, equity and 10 on earnout, something like that. And the end of the first year rolls around and we had to do 13 million EBITDA to get our first year's earn out of 10 million cash. But they had replaced our accounting with accounting at the home office and replaced our CEO. And we thought the deal was done. I remember we get to the end of the first year and I was like, hey, when's the payout coming? And they were like, hey, you didn't earn 13 million. You earned 12 million, 500,000. They're like, what are you talking about? And they said, you still have 500,000 in accounts receivable. That doesn't count. And we lost $10 million because we weren't watching that one hurt now uh the flip side of that is the subprime credit market crashed the following year and that company went from 60 million in revenue to you know like five and the entire company ended up getting sold for 10 million so they took a major hit on that deal i don't feel sorry for them so going back to coaches did you have any coaches working with you during these times or any ceos out there that you were kind of studying trying to learn from? And if so, what were they doing that impressed you? You know, I learned the most from my senior partner, Steve. Um, 
just because he had done it before a couple of times in the internet space. And so literally, I think I told you very early on when I partnered with him and then learned that I need to start listening to him. That's when we grew the most, made the most money, had the most success. I will tell you, most of my mentors over the years comes from about 100 to 120 books I have sitting in my library that I have studied, underlined, reread, absorbed information. I like to say that if you're talking to me, you're probably talking to about 20 or 30 different offers at any given t- authors at any given time, because there's pretty much nothing original out of my mouth. It's all something I've read and just absorbed uh, from something else. Somebody, you know, something I've read someplace else. Well, I guess I got to ask, what are some top books that you'd recommend for, for myself and our listeners? Oh, my gosh. My favorite books, The E-Myth Revisited. Uh, second is going to be Rich Dad, Poor Dad for a New Entrepreneur. Great book. My third is going to be Blink and Blink. Uh, these, all three of these are wrapped up in my book just all over the place. Blink is huge. I love Malcolm Gladwell. The Outliers is another one. Um, so I'd say those are probably my top four books. And then going from this whole journey, I mean, yes, you got the restaurant, which I guess is you know, all athletes and, and successful businessmen, but you're also now on city council. Yep. What were the thoughts behind that? Why, why go there? All right. So here's a story. So we had sold the second company, made a b- bunch of money, and I decided to quit. I'd been busting my hump for 20 years. I was tired. I mean, I was the dark to dark seven days a week guy for 20 years. Finally had all this money, started to get everything I ever wanted in life, had all the toys you can imagine. And so I went out to Park City for a month to ski. And I have a friend out there who's very, very successful. He's also one of my mentors, written a couple of New York Times bestselling books. And we're sitting at lunch and, and Paul says, okay, Brian, what are you going to do next? And I said, I don't know, Paul, I guess I'll build another company. And he said, why? Do you need the money? I said, no, I don't need the money. He goes, and why are you doing it? And I said, I, I have no idea. I don't know what else to do. This is all I've ever done. And I remember he told me, he said, Brian, here's the deal. You need to find something you're passionate about and you need to figure out a way to give back. And when you do those two things, then you'll be happy until then you're just going to be on the rap and you know, on the treadmill. And I was like, I didn't even know what to think about that. I, he said, do you have a passion? I said, I, I don't even know what that means. I, I've just been building businesses. He said, you need to find a passion. And it probably took me five more years. And I found that writing books was a passion. I love writing, right? So I've got two books done. I've got two more in the works. Um, and I love working with young entrepreneurs and I love teaching and speaking. So this is a passion of mine. This is why I'm building my podcast and my new business. And on the giving back side, I've always been interested in politics, but you know, politics has gotten so dirty and ugly that, you know, I didn't really want to subject my family to the attacks that you could, that people just come after you for no reason. So while I was interested, I didn't do it, but I was at my hometown and I own this restaurant. It's one of the most popular, it's probably the most popular restaurant in town. And we were hosting a meeting for the Rotary and the, and the Chamber of Commerce. And I was over there and there was a couple city councilmen there who I'm friends with. And I, and I was talking to one of them. I said, Hey man, tell me about city council. And my friend Dan said, city council is the only level of politics that you can literally talk to your neighbors, other business owners, find a problem, have it on the agenda in city council within two weeks and a week later vote it, and you can change everybody's life for the good. And you can do that almost instantaneously. And I thought, wow, that, that's really a way to give back. Because if you make your town better, then you've left a, a living legacy on what you've done. So it's kind of my giving back thing. So passion and give back. So just wondering from that conversation to reality, is it lines up or being on city council now, you're like, actually, Sean, this is not what I expected at all. No, I've made substantial changes. Uh, I'm the public safety liaison. So I sit over fire and police. Uh, I've made changes for our police officers, our firemen. I've got stations being rebuilt. I got them raises. I've got our jail reopened. I've locked in on the budget process where we were wasting money on some stuff. So yeah, I've made a significant difference and I'm actually having a lot of fun doing it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been good. And is that your hundred percent focus or are there some other things that you're working on right now? Uh, well, first I still got the restaurant company, the technology company, the real estate company, other people do all that stuff. Um, 
my latest passion is Brian Will Media, which is my new company, which we launched the podcast. So it's about the podcast. It's about the book. Uh, we're launching a coaching and consulting company. I already do consulting for big companies, big insurance carriers, but I want to bring it down to the level of the individual entrepreneurs because, as I like to say, last year, five and a half million people started a new business in America. That's according to the Chamber of Commerce, I think it is. Five and a half million. And we know that in any given year, only 60% of them actually turn a profit. And we also know that 70% of them will fail. So if 5 million people start a business, that means three and a half million people that start a business every year are going to fail. And I, I have found that they fail for a lot of the same reasons. And we've talked a lot about those today. It's ego. It's not bringing in a mentor. It's not understanding who you are. It's not understanding who you're not. It's getting your ego in check. It's finding a coach and a mentor. Pretty much the same reasons people fail over and over. So that's kind of my new passion is to work with entrepreneurs. Fantastic. And Brian, before wrapping up, is there any other information you think our our listeners should know any sales tips, any coaching advice that a listener overseas, whether it's an emerging country or wherever, could go, wow, that was that was a key takeaway. I'm going to utilize that. I'm going to use that. I'm going to give you the key takeaway story, and it's going to tie in with everything we've talked about. And and I think I I may have mentioned to you to you earlier, but Sean, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. You ready? Sean, what kind of phone do you have? Uh, Android. Google you have an Android. Seven. Okay, you're not going to help me. Most people have an Apple, <laughs> an iPhone. So iPhone, <laughs> I, iPhone as we know. You're ruining hate, my whole story here, man. I hate Let's just failing the first question. <laughs> Apple that makes the iPhone is run by a guy named Tim Cook, right? Tim Cook is the CEO of Apple. Apple is the biggest company on planet Earth, right? They're huge, successful. Tim Cook is the CEO. Apple has a board of directors, right? Every major company, you're in Silicon Valley, everybody's got a board of directors. Tell me what the board of directors does, Sean. Looks over, gives advice to the CEO, key hires in that, manage, bring in help when it's needed. They, yep, a ton of things that people don't know about. Yeah, so every quarter-ish, somewhere around that, the board of directors for Apple comes in and they sit around the giant table, right? And they got their Jimmy John subs and they, they crank it open and they're like, okay, Tim, tell us what's going on. And Tim's like, well, I got this issue. And you know, Foxconn in China, we might want to move it out of there because we're having issues politically. And all these people come from different backgrounds, but they're all highly successful people, right? And once he talks about all the issues, they all give their input. They give their input to help Tim Cook make decisions to move Apple forward, right? That's what the board of directors does. If Tim Cook needs a board of directors to help him run his business, what makes you as a young entrepreneur think you don't need help, that you can do it all by yourself? Are you smarter than Tim Cook? I doubt it. Get a coach, get a mentor, or risk failure. All right. That's my takeaway. That, Brian, if anyone wants to get a hold, hold of you, learn more about what you're working on, about your books, anything, what's the best way to go about doing that? www.brianwillmedia.com. That's my website. Everything's on there. Fantastic. And for our audience out there, well, I'm not the host of the Silicon Valley podcast. I'm an investment banker focused on mergers, acquisition, growth capital. Connect with me through LinkedIn my name, or just go to the Silicon Valley podcast. We have all our past episodes there. Connect with me there and you'll, you know, this episode will be there and I'm sure you're going to re-listen to it multiple times. I mean, gosh, I, I can, there's so many great takeaways from this episode. So, so Brian, I really want to thank you for being a guest on this week's episode of the Sean, Silicon it's been Valley awesome. Podcast. Thank you. Lots of fun. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Dropout Multimillionaire. To learn more about how we can help you with your business, or if you'd like to be a guest on the show, visit www.brianwillmedia.com or the Dropout MM on Instagram.